invite you to take your Bibles and turn in the book of Romans to Romans chapter 7. Our scripture reading for tonight is Romans 7, verses 7 through 25. The sermon will focus primarily on verses 7 through 13, but we'll want to um, look toward the end of the chapter as well. Romans 7, beginning in verse 7. I remind you this is God's word. So let's give our attention to its reading. What then shall we say? That the law is sin? By no means. Yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. For I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive, and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me, and through it, killed me. So the law is holy, and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. Did that which is good then bring death to me? By no means. It was sin producing death in me through what is good, in order that sin might be shown to be sin, and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. For we know that the law is spiritual, that I am of the flesh, sold under sin. For I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. You know, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law, that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law, waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind. With my flesh I serve the law of sin. The grass withers, the flower fades. The word of our God will stand forever. Let's pray and ask God's blessing upon our study tonight. Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for this night that we can gather together, we can hear your word, and we ask, O oh God, that you would continue your work within us, that work that was begun, that your word promises you will carry on to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. Continue that work within us this night as we bring ourselves under your word. Help us, O oh God, to hear with faith. Help us, O oh Lord, to understand For we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, brothers and sisters, last week we began our new series on the Heidelberg Catechism. Remind you that this is not a, an exposition or, or an exe, exegesis of the Catechism itself, but rather allowing the Catechism to guide my own preparation and the sermons or the, the, uh, the scriptures that I will select uh, for us to focus on week by week. And last week we began considering our only comfort in life and in death. We looked at the comfort that we have in Christ, knowing that we are not our own. We belong to our faithful Savior. I remind you that the second question after that great and well-known question is how many things must you know to live and die in the joy of this comfort? And there are three. First, how great my sin and misery are. 
Second, how I am delivered from all my sins and misery. And third, how I am to thank God for such deliverance. Guilt, grace, gratitude. This is the outline of the Heidelberg Catechism, and as a number of commentators on the Catechism point out, it actually is the outline of the book of Romans itself. It speaks of the law of God. It speaks of the <coughs> sin that mankind is under. It speaks of the grace of God in Jesus Christ. And it speaks of our gratitude and how we are to respond to that grace. Well, tonight's questions begin to deal with that first part that we must know. How great my sin and misery are. We note first, before we get into our text, the personal approach of the catechism. It is my sin. It is my misery. Not sin and misery in general. Not sin and misery out there. Not a sense of brokenness in the world. Not just a world that is fallen. All those things are true. But what must you know? You must know your sin and your misery. You see, we must understand that we are sinners. You must be able to say, I am a sinner. The word for misery that's used here, it actually originally, and in the original, carried with it the idea of being out of a country or in a foreign land. And it was applied in a way that was considered the extremity of civil punishment, that is, banishment. Misery indicates the unhappy condition of punishment, separation from home and from friends. It's the picture of Adam and Eve being cast out of the garden, driven by God out of the garden and out of his presence, and the flaming sword being put in its place, in, in its way, in their way to return. This is the misery that mankind is in. This is our misery apart from Jesus Christ. So how do you come to know your misery? That is what our catechism begins to think about this evening. The law of God tells me. God's law is revealed in His Word. It is His revealed will that directs us what to do and what not to do. And so I've selected this evening Romans chapter 7, primarily verses 7 through 13, to reflect upon the law of God, particularly as the Apostle Paul helps us to understand several things. First, that the law brings knowledge of sin. Second, that the law rouses our sin. And third, the law exposes the sinfulness of sin. Let's consider these points in turn this evening. Romans 7, beginning in verse 7, and the law brings knowledge of our sin. What then shall we say, Paul begins to ask, is the law sin? That's a good question. In fact, that's a great question. You would almost think that perhaps if the law had not exposed sin, that maybe, maybe there would be no sin. If God had not said, you shall not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, then maybe we would still be in paradise. Maybe we would still be in Eden. If God had not told Israel from Mount Sinai, what they should not do. Maybe they would still be in the promised land. Is the law sin? Paul answers it very clearly. By no means. He answers it in the negative, in the strongest possible way. The law is not the problem. For if the law were the problem, then God is at fault. And so Paul's point is clear. It's not the law. It is our sin. Just as Adam could not blame God, though he tried, this woman that you gave me, gave me some of the tree, some of the fruit of the tree, and I ate. Just as Adam could not blame God, so we cannot blame God. We cannot blame the law. The law of God reveals to us, though, the reality of our sin and misery, and it shows us, in fact, that our sin is is sin. It shows us our sin and our misery. Paul draws on his own experience to drive this home. He's likely drawing on a personal experience. Look there with me. Yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. 
I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had said, you shall not covet. Remember, Paul believed that he was blameless when he was a Pharisee. Philippians 3 and verse 6. But something happened. Something awakened in Paul the depths of his sin. He went from being one under the law who was blameless to one who killed for the sake of that law. Somewhere in there, and we don't know where, Paul began to consider this 10th commandment and to see his own sin. You shall not covet. Covetousness has many forms. It can be lust, which is one of the ways in which it is translated in Matthew chapter 5. It can be jealousy or pride. As one commentator posed, perhaps Paul's inability to answer Stephen in Acts chapter 7 aroused in him a pride for his position, awakened a kind of covetousness in him. We don't know. But what we do know is that Paul went from being a Pharisee who did not normally persecute the church to being one who breathed murderous threats against the church. Between Acts 7 and Acts Chapter 8, Paul says that it's the law that revealed his sin. But he goes on to affirm in verse 12 that the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. The law generally, he says, is holy. But then he focuses even on this particular commandment, which is what he's referring to, the 10th commandment. And he affirms that it is holy, righteous, and good. Why is, the whole, why is the law of God holy, righteous, and good? We would say, first of all, the law reveals God's nature. He is holy. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? Moses sings in Exodus 15, in verse 11. Isaiah hears the angels singing in, 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 in the heavenly glory, Holy, holy, holy. He is set apart. He is set apart from all creation because he is the one who made all of creation. But he's also pure. There is nothing in God that is sinful, that is wrong. He is perfectly holy. The law then is a creaturely reflection of God's holiness. And make no mistake, he is not just quantitatively greater than us. He is qualitatively greater. God is holy. God is also righteous. He is the standard of righteousness. That is, his, he's, he's upright. What he does is right. In the court of heaven, 100 out of 100 times, God would be, be declared right if he were even ever on trial, which he wouldn't be. Because he's the righteous judge of all the earth. And God is also good. And not just in his nature. He is good. He is, he, is, he is absolutely good. Infinite, eternally, and almighty in his goodness. But he's also good in what he does. Not just when we see it. But even when we cannot see it. Even when we disagree with it. Psalm 73 in verse 1, truly God is good. The psalmist begins, but goes on to acknowledge that he doesn't see that all the time. All of this the law reveals because the law of God is a reflection of his nature. And in that case, it brings us to the second point of why the law is good, holy, holy, right, and good. Because it reveals God's expectations. He calls his people to be holy. We see this all throughout Scripture in the Old and the New Testaments. You must be perfect as your Heavenly Father is perfect, Jesus says in Matthew 5 and verse 48. You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Leviticus 19 and verse 2. God calls his people to be holy. He calls us to be righteous. That is, we must stand before him and give an account. He calls us to be righteous. He calls us to be good. That is to reflect God in our lives. We, we, we came across that right in, 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 that, in, in the fourth question. 
The fourth question with regard to how you learn or how you come to know what it is that God requires, the law. And, and, and the catechism cites Matthew 22. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. You see, contrary to popular opinion, Jesus is not reducing the law of God to some attainable ideal of love. That's the way that it's often considered these days. Jesus just says to love, and as long as we love, and we're not going to talk about what that love is, but as long as we love, everything's okay. No, he says that all the law, go back to the Old Testament, look at the law, look at the prophets, it all boils down to this. Love God. Love your neighbor. You see, it's useful to boil it down like that, because then it reveals to us that we fail. You see, it's easy to sit back I and mean, we be... You know, we looked at the sixth commandment this morning in our, in our service, in our confession of sin. It's easy to sit back and say, I, I'm not, I've not murdered anybody. I'm blameless. When we boil it down to love God and love neighbor, we know, do we not? We know those times in which we fail. This is what we would call in sort of Reformed Tradition, the first use of the law. The first use of the law. That it drives us to see our sin. That it reveals to us that we are not perfect. That sin is not just a problem out there, but a problem in here. But Paul wants to say more. It's not just that the law reveals our sin. Our second point, the law rouses our sin. This is saying something very different. It's saying that in some way, the law brings about, is it responsible for, that's why I've chosen the word rouses, our sin. Look what Paul says in verse 8. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. Apart from the law, sin lies dead. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me. And through it, it, killed me. Now Paul is not trying to slough off the responsibility. No, that was what Adam did. That was what Israel did. Paul knows his own sin. But he's trying to help us to understand the relationship, why it is, how it is that the law rouses up sin. You see, sin is pictured as active by the Apostle Paul. It seizes the opportunity of the law. In this way, it's a reflection a bit, maybe an echo of what, of what God says to Cain. That sin is crouching at the door. Once he became aware of the law, Paul says, the sin within him took the opportunity to produce covetousness. This is how James says it. In James 1, verses 13 to 15, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. And that word for desire, it's covetousness. And desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Paul is filling out this image that James gives us by saying that the way in which we are lured and enticed by desire, in part, is through the knowledge of the law. What does he mean when he says, apart from the law, sin lies dead? There's actually no verb in this sentence in the Greek. For apart from the law... Sin, dead. Most translations will supply some kind of to be verb, is or was. The ESV chooses lies, and I think it's a good choice, since the point Paul seems to be making is not that law brings about sin, but rather that sin lies as dead and then is roused up by the law. 
John Murray in his commentary on Romans says that Paul here in verse 8 is not speaking about the non-existence of sin, but of sin as existing yet dead. And what he is referring to is the inertness, that is the inactivity, in that sense, the deadness of sin, in contrast with the coming to life of sin through knowledge of the law. So we want to affirm that the law does not cause sin. Paul goes on to say that the law is spiritual, it's holy, it's righteous, and it's good. The problem is sin. The problem is me and you. The sin seizes the opportunity of the law. It seems as though, or it may seem as though, Paul is personalizing sin as something separate from us. And it, it, yes and no. Not with regard to the unbeliever. Their sin is their nature. That is why our question number five says that I am inclined by nature to hate God and my neighbor. And that's very strong language, I know. But in our sinful nature, that is what we are inclined to. That is why we must say, my sin, my misery. And it is this war that goes on in the believer, regenerated, redeemed by Christ, given a new nature. But Paul goes on to affirm this kind of, this kind of struggle that, that continues within the believer. We see it here, we see it in other passages as well, but here Paul seems to, to wrestle with it the most. So much so, by the way, that there is so much literature out there as to whether or not Romans 7 verses 14 and following are regenerate Paul or unregenerate Paul. Is it Paul or is it Saul? And I'm not going to solve that tonight. For my part, I believe he's speaking of himself. It seems as though he's talking about his, his actual experience. But I know that there are good commentators and faithful believers who see it a different way. What we see in this text, though, and what we're limiting ourselves to is to understand how it is that sin, that, 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 that the law brings about the knowledge of sin, but here, how it rouses it up. Sin brings death through the law, Paul says. And Paul is not excusing sin. In fact, there are some who come away from this and say, well, if this is true, then sin is not really my fault. And I almost think that Paul would have the same response to that as he does to other questions. May it never be. Absolutely not. Or he would just smack you upside the head. Paul is not excusing sin. Just as, not, just as Paul is not blaming the law for sin, he is not excusing sin because of the law. As though if it didn't exist, then we wouldn't sin. Verse 9 might be thought to say that. He says, I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. If sin is dead means that it lies unnoticed and unknown, then by being alive, Paul must mean that state of security in which the, un the unbeliever finds himself is a false security. Charles Hodge writes this. He says, Every believer can adopt the language of the apostle. He can say that he was alive without the law. He was secure and free from any painful consciousness of sin. And when the commandment came, when he was brought to see how holy and how broad God's law is, sin was aroused and revealed, and all his fancied security and goodness disappeared. Point being that the sin, it rouses the law rouses sin. The law reveals sin. And Paul goes further in verse 13. Did that which is good then bring death to me? By no means. It was sin producing death in me through what is good. In order that sin might be shown to be sin and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. And this is our third point. The law exposes the sinfulness of sin. Again, the law does not bring death, but rather the law shows sin to be what it actually is. It shows it to be sin. 
It's when the law comes out and sin finds the occasion that it is shown to be sin. Think of it this way. If you have an only child and they seem to play alone just fine, they love their toys, they take good care of them, you think that everything is fine. You think that your child is maybe even selfless, is even willing to play nicely with others. And then you add a second child and the law to share the toys. And the child you thought was so protective of the toys all of a sudden becomes possessive of the toys. The command to share simply exposed the child's sinful heart and awakened the sin within them. And through the commandment, Paul says that it becomes sinful beyond measure. What a great phrase. Exceedingly sinful. This is the purpose of the law. Paul will go on to say in Galatians. And we know how this goes. We know the story of scripture. Adam and Eve's sin, the commandment, aroused in Eve a desire to take the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Israel's sin, the commandment to have no other God besides the Lord, aroused in them a desire to and out came a calf. David's sin with Bathsheba at a time in the spring when kings go off to war. David was on a roof. And sin became evident. And maybe it's in David's case that we see sinful beyond measure. Surely David knew the seventh commandment. Surely David knew the sixth commandment. But as he panicked, as he sought to cover up his own sin, it just showed itself to be sinful beyond measure. That is, that David himself was sinful. And David knew. David knew the law of God. He knows when he confesses against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. But we know this. We, don't, we, we have the scripture stories to remind us of it. We also know, we also know in our own culture, we know in our own homes, we know in our own hearts how it is that sin exposes itself deeper and deeper. And this is Paul's point. This is a real purpose of the law of God. It not only exposes our sin, but it also increases it. We can't miss this because it's the key to understanding what Paul is saying in Romans. It's the key really to understanding Galatians. It's, it's the key to understanding the gospel that Paul proclaims. Because of our sin and misery, we need a Savior. We don't just need some fine-tuning. We don't just need to be made a bit better. We don't just need some, 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 some further education. Maybe if it was 20 commandments instead of 10, then maybe they would have known, but they had 613 laws. Whether it's one commandment in the garden or 613 in the promised land, we know, we know that the law reveals our sin. Why? Because we're sinners. Because we need to be saved. And that's the end of this passage. That's the end of this chapter. Looking down, the Apostle Paul does not simply say, sit back and say, well, that's just the way things are. No, he says there in, in Romans chapter 7, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death. Everything that Paul has said, focusing on the law, everything about the sin that was revealed, the sin that was roused, the sin that was made to be beyond measure, drives him to the cross. It leads to only one conclusion. Paul needs to be saved. You see, beloved, when we say that, that, that we must know our sin and misery, we must know or I must know my sin and my misery. We must come to the point that the Apostle Paul does. 
to recognize that there is no amount of good that we can do to sort of balance out the scales. You guys have seen, seen the pictures, right? On that great judgment. And there's the feather of truth weighed against the man's heart. Well, that's a fiction anyway. But if we were to put God's law on one side, we would always fail. And it doesn't matter how many good things you do. There are no such things as works of super erogation above and beyond what God commands. No, our only hope is Jesus. And that's where Paul drives himself. And that's where he drives us. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. You see, he knows the wretchedness of his condition. He knows that apart from Christ, there is no hope. We are to know the only comfort in life and in death. It begins by understanding our sin and our misery. And I know that that's not popular. And that's not always comfortable. But I said it before. But the, 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 the diamond of salvation shines brightest against the blackness. That black background. And that black background is sin. Not sin in general. Not sin out there. Your sin. My sin. This is why we need Jesus. We cry out with the Apostle Paul that he is our only hope. But what a hope he is.